pray before we get into God's word this morning. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping, of uh, getting in touch again of what it means to be uh, forgiven of our sins, to be set free because of your gift at the cross. We thank you for uh, Billy Graham for a life well, well lived. And Lord, may each of us have the confidence uh, to be clear and to be certain of the gift that you have given us through your life and your blood shed on the cross for our sins. Lord, we thank you, Lord, give us uh, your spirit now as we gather around your word, as we have your spirit revealed to us the things that you would have us learn and know and experience today uh, together as your children. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, I've never been there, but I've been told that there's a palace in Venice, Italy, that's among the most lavish centers of power that the world has ever seen. At the heart of this palace is an unusual room that is lined with drawers from floor to ceiling. And if you went there and you opened any one of these drawers, you would find thousands of documents from centuries past. And in these documents, they list uh, the status of every person in the city whose child you were, whose grandchild you were, and how you were connected to royalty or merchants or um, uh, other important people in that city. And these documents basically defined where you'd live, how much you'd be educated, whether people trusted you, or how much attention people paid to you, even showed you their estimate of how long you would live. You know, in some ways, really, things haven't changed that much. Maybe we're not so formal about how we do that, but we still rank people. And I'd say that status really drives all sorts of things. The pressure to get good grades in school, to excel in sports or dance or music, or to get into the right colleges or the right jobs or the right neighborhoods. And it seems that people with status seem to gain all sorts of benefits that come with the good life. And while this maybe isn't written on documents that are placed in drawers in some palace, it's still basically the same thing. I think it's very interesting that scientists are define, uh, discovering that, that our brains constantly size up the crowd in whatever room that we're in. In fact, for most humans, our most valued possession is our status. I mean, think about the lengths that many people go to protect or to increase their status. Or, or why status, for instance, for many people is more rewarding than earning money. Or conversely, how you feel if your sense of status decreases. You know, it can almost feel like your life is in danger. I think it's why retiring or losing a job is so difficult. Researchers, in fact, have discovered that your brain manages status using roughly the same circuits as the circuits that are used to determine if we're going to survive or not. So maybe this explains why it feels kind of good to meet somebody who's worse off than yourself or why some people love to win arguments, or why people work so hard to land that corner office or play for points on online games. I know I'm meddling here a little bit. We have this drive to raise our status compared to the status of others. Well, it turns out that our brain have, have these very complex maps of pecking orders. The pecking order of people all around us and that, in turn, influences how we interact with others. It's also interesting, I think, that status is relative. Some people measure status on who's older or who's younger. For others, maybe it's who's richer or smarter or stronger or funnier. Or, in the case of some Pacific Islanders, who weighs more, which I really love. I think that's a great measure of status. I'm well on my way. So I suspect also that this drive for status really explains why following Jesus can be so difficult for many people. 
You know, because Jesus keeps saying and he keeps doing the things that suggest that following him means moving down the ladder of status and worldly success, not up. And this runs counter, really, to, to all sorts of wiring in our brains. Researchers are actually finding that going up or down in status triggers a very acute emotional response in our brains. Maybe you've felt that before. Well, as you know, we're calling our worship series during this time of Lent, we're calling it Finding Space. And today we're talking about dying to status to make space for authentic relationship. I don't think we can pretend that this will be an easy journey. This morning we're going to take a closer look at an episode between Jesus and one particular woman and how each one of them really died to their own status to make room for something far greater. We find this story in John's Gospel, chapter 4. Perhaps you want to take your Bibles out or your Bibles on your phones and follow this story there with me. We're not going to read it word for word, but we're going to walk through it, and you'll, I want you to follow along as we go. John chapter 4. As the story opens, we find Jesus traveling north from Jerusalem back home to the region of Galilee. And trouble was brewing in the land of Jerusalem, or in the city of Jerusalem, evidently. John the Baptist had been thrown in prison, and Jesus was known to be connected with him. Becca, I want you to show the next slide here. Um, instead of taking the longer route from Jerusalem to, uh, up to Galilee, which most people went from Jerusalem, if you see on either one of those maps, to the east, and they went over to, um, I think I need to point that way for you guys. Um, uh, they went down to the city of Jericho, and they went up all along uh, the, the river bed, or the, or the valley, along the Jordan River. And, uh, and that was a lot longer, actually, and then when they got a little closer to the Sea of Galilee, then they went inland to get to uh, the region of Galilee. But instead of doing that, and most Jews did that, that was their preferred route, Jesus decided to go straight through up to, uh, up to Samaria. Um, and this area today, in fact, if you, if you listen to the news, this is known as the West Bank. Um, but it helps really to know the context of this, because centuries earlier, Samaria had been part of the northern kingdom of Israel, which had turned away from God. And people considered Sumerians not only to be pagan, to be kind of spiritual backsliders, but also to be traitors because they had interbred with Israel's enemies. And then later, uh, when Alexander the Great came a few hundred years before the time of Jesus and had conquered this area, uh, and then with later generals, that they, these Samaritans were known as sort of colluders with the Greeks because the Greeks set up sort of an enemy base by which that they could attack the region of Judea. Also, by the time Jesus came along, there's a sort of smoldering tension between the regions of Judea and Samaria, and it's fueled by just these centuries of terrible political fights. But it seems that since Jesus was the kind of guy who made space for outcasts, it seems like he intentionally took the route that went straight up through the heart of Samaria, really enemy territory. So let's consider the scene as it opens and as we look around verse 5. Evidently, we find Jesus and his disciples arriving at a well. It was known as Jacob Well, Jacob's Well near the city or the village of Sychar. And his disciples go, decide to go into the neighboring village to buy food in Sychar, and they left Jesus alone. Well, very tired, it says here, John says, from a long walk, Jesus sat wearily beside the well around noontime. And soon we read, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. So here's Jesus sitting on the edge of the well, and he's kind of in the way. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Now, as you maybe know, women back then, it was usually women who collected the water. That was a woman's job to do, and it was really hard work. It was also an opportunity for women to gather and to talk, either early in the morning or late in the day, to escape the Mediterranean heat. But because it was noon, this woman was most likely alone. Perhaps she chose this time of day intentionally, maybe to avoid other women. It's also true that in this time and in this culture, men were rarely seen alone with any woman, even a wife or daughter, out in public. 
They rarely even spoke with them. And single men never spoke to or touched a woman at any time. And since Jesus was functioning and really was known as a rabbi, he would be that much more strict in following the rules. On top of that, this woman was a Samaritan. So she was undoubtedly really taken aback when Jesus asked her for a drink from the well. It also explains why the disciples, when they returned with lunch, were equally shocked to find Jesus interacting with this woman. One commentator, in fact, says that it's not that Jesus would ask her help for a drink, ask for help with a drink, is that he would ask her anything. So in this conversation, Jesus begins crossing all sorts of boundaries. He doesn't seem to care about his status or his reputation as a man or as a Jew or as a godly man or even as a religious leader. It seems like his only concern was to provide space for this woman to have a spiritual encounter with the living God. Now, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, I think it's worth stopping to consider. When do you or I set aside our status or our reputation for the sake of a spiritual connection with someone lower or even higher on the social ladder? What would that look like? Who would that person maybe be? In fact, if somebody comes to mind, I encourage you to just take out your notes and just write, who's the name of somebody higher on the ladder or lower on your personal ladder that you might go, oh, I wonder if I could share Jesus with them. Just jot that name down. Or maybe a name will come to you a little later. Well, now we're going to take a little detour. We're going to take a detour to the book of Philippians book that Paul wrote to the early Christians there in the city of Philippi, chapter 2 of Philippians. So if you want to go a few books farther back in your Bible. And in this section of Philippians, it's such a powerful section, Paul says that we are to have the same mind as Christ Jesus. In fact, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, but in humility, consider others what? Better than yourselves. What he's trying to say is that as Jesus followers, we promote and we raise the status of others, even at our own expense. Paul says, keep looking to Jesus, who himself intentionally emptied himself of all of his status, of all of his privileges, for our sakes. Again, as we've said, this is not easy to do, because our brains are wired to seek status. And I think it's going to even take more than simply remembering Jesus. I think it's going to require asking Jesus to help us, to help us kind of rewire our brains to think differently about this whole issue of status and to change our habits and to change our practices. We need Jesus, for example, to give us the desire to to walk to places, to walk up to people that we normally wouldn't engage with or to drive into certain neighborhoods or go to certain stores or or do the things that we otherwise wouldn't do. Then I think to pray and ask God for the courage to start some conversations with unlikely people, whatever whatever that means for you. You know, in Philippians 2, Paul is not only just concerned with our attitudes, he also cares about our actions. You know, for Paul, it's not enough to feel humble We need to act humbly. It's not enough to think about serving. It means actually serving. It's not enough to admire Jesus. It means cultivating the same kind of relationships that Jesus cultivated. Now, Jesus could do that through his Father's power and because he was secure in his identity. Paul goes on to say, because he was in very nature God, because Christ had the highest status as God, he did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Being equal with God meant for him not pulling privilege, but pursuing the priorities of a selfless God. But you know what? 
we can do the same thing. We can die to status in order to make space, to find space for authentic relationships. Because as followers of Jesus, we have access to the same power and the same identity that Jesus had. We are sons and daughters. We are heirs of the living God. And we have the greatest security through the power of the Holy Spirit, who also gives us the power and the compassion to serve and connect with any person on this planet, from the very greatest to the very least. Let's go back now to this story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And I want you to consider things kind of from this woman's perspective. You're someone who's probably familiar with rejection and low status. I think maybe at various times we've all felt left out and know how terrible that that feels. She's also alone with a man, evidently some kind of leader in a very patriarchal society. I wonder if she's thinking if she was safe with him. Also, even if he wasn't like a dangerous sort of guy, you know, any time an authority walks into a room, it's very common for people to feel this sort of threat response go off in your brains. Then after Jesus asks her for a drink from this well, he starts this really confusing conversation about living water. He's talking about a new quality of life that only comes from God's spirit, but she really wasn't understanding that yet. Next, he tells her to go and get her husband. He suppose this was setting off a lot of alarm bells in her. She says she has no husband. You are correct, Jesus tells her. Actually, you have had five husbands, and the man you are currently living with is not your husband. You know, I wonder if she kind of felt like somebody, a woman walking alone at night and then being attacked from behind. Where did that come from? So this woman's status is really threatened at several levels. And I think it's so interesting that right at that point, she changes the subject. She kind of tries to get the upper hand by engaging in this, well, my church is better than your church sort of conversation. Uh, What's the best place to worship? Is it Mount Gerizim in Samaria, her favorite place? Or is it at that temple down in Jerusalem? She kind of is picking a fight even, even though she is tempted, I am sure, to flee. I find it so interesting that this woman doesn't flee. You know, even though her status is triggered in a thousand ways with Jesus, she hangs in there with him. And working through this sense of threat, she tells Jesus in verse 25, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus then says, I am, I am the Messiah. And while we'll never know what was going on inside of her head, I suspect that for the first time, she began to taste this living water that Jesus was talking about. Whatever happened, We read that as Jesus' disciples returned with lunch, back bringing lunch to Jesus, uh, this woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village. It seems that after years of feeling shame and being left out, she leaves all of this and her water jar behind and, and runs back to the village, John says, telling everyone, come, see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? And people in that village heard her. They paid attention to her, even though she was even lower on the rung than they were. And they streamed out to see this Jesus that she was talking about. I just want to ask you at this point, who who are you identifying with in this story? Are you identifying with Jesus or with the Samaritan woman? You know, I don't think it matters if you're male or female, or you're single, or you're married, or you're young, or you're old. Maybe you have kind of a high view of yourself. You have position or some privilege, and life for you is very good. 
God is calling you to something more significant, something greater, and that kind of scares you. Because you know it's going to mean dying to yourself and surrendering your status. It maybe for you means finding new roads and new ways to associate with people that you never have associated with before. People maybe that you kind of look down on. It's going to mean serving them. It will mean taking the lower place and being used by God to engage in real relationship with unlikely people and to offer them the water of life. Others of you maybe have felt left out, maybe for years. You're not sure how high you are on the ladder of success. Sometimes you get a little defensive, maybe you're easily threatened. Maybe you act like you're always right, but underneath is really some insecurity. Maybe for you, life feels a bit hopeless. You often find yourself trying to either hide or flee. Now, these threats, these status issues for either type of person are real. But they're not the final word in your life. You see, when we come to face to face with Jesus, our status compared with others becomes irrelevant. Jesus loves each of us so dearly. He calls each one of us to die to ourselves. You know, and as we start to do that, he really frees us for some extraordinary relationships with himself and with other people. As Jesus empties himself of all of his privilege in this story, he gets a first-hand look at God's transforming power in this woman's life, which is an even greater privilege. And next, if we went on to finish the story, he sees an entire village believing and then experiencing God's living water. And as this woman dies to her own mixture of shame, as well as kind of her status as a proud Samaritan, she also gains a relationship with the living God. She even finds herself propelled to greatness as she brings many others to this life-giving water. I want to tell you guys a story. It was uh, earlier this week, and I was thinking about this message and this whole issue of status and just of whose life has been touched by Jesus, who has received this life-giving water. And I ran across earlier this week a picture of my young friend, Michael. Michael had been part of our church in Alexandria for a couple years, and he was a number of guys from the county jail that we would pick up each Sunday morning to bring to church, and then we'd take them out for lunch at Pizza Ranch afterwards. Michael's kind of a strapping guy who lifts weights, He's also Southeast Asian and had been raised Buddhist. We didn't have a lot of Buddhists hanging out in Alexandria, so that was kind of a new thing for us. And for him, all this stuff about Jesus and church was kind of a stretch for him. And befriending guys, quite frankly, like Michael, was a stretch for us too. Him and other guys with really tough backgrounds, and we didn't quite know what bad things they had done in their past. And then they were in the pews next to our children, worshiping and all of these sort of concerns we have. Well, it took a year or so for Michael to begin to soften and to understand Jesus' love for him and that God's grace had paid for all of his sins. So one evening we were at City Park uh, in Alexandria at a recovery picnic, and I was talking to Michael, and we were talking about Jesus some, and he told me that he really did believe and that he had given his life to Jesus just in the last couple days. So we get talking, and here we are at the park by the lake, and it's like, dude, let's just, let's just get you baptized, you know? And he and another guy who had recently accepted Jesus, Fabian, decided that they were going to be baptized. So we just kind of segued the picnic over to the beach, and there's a couple of the top pictures there of baptizing them that night right in Lake Henry. 
Well, eventually Michael moved to the cities for a better job, and we moved too and kind of lost track of him. And I'd see his Facebook posts from time to time, but over time they got to be less and less. And I was a little concerned that he seemed to be hanging out kind of with the wrong crowd. And there's a strong pull also in Asian culture to have duty towards your family and his family were not Christians. And for a while, I, I just hadn't seen anything about him, and I'd really kind of forgotten about Michael. Like I said, this Monday, I was looking through some pictures and came across these baptism pictures. I was just kind of thinking about him and went home that night, and I get a call Monday night from my friend Bruce, and Bruce wanted me to pray for his daughter who's going into surgery the next day, and, uh, but also said that um, he, he just, uh, his wife, Mary Kay, was working in town, and ran into Michael. And I thought, that's so interesting. I just thought of him today for the first time in, in months, really. And, uh, and, uh, and when Michael had run into Mary Kay, she, she was like, oh, so good to see you, Michael. Are you back in town? And are things going? And, and he said, not, not so well. And, uh, and she hardly recognized him. He had lost a lot of weight. It was really thin. And sometimes when you see young people who you know, real muscular, and then they turn really thin. You wonder if they're kind of back on drugs and doing some stuff that they're maybe not supposed to be up to. Well, she gave him a hug, and she said, you know, anytime, if you want to give me a call, I would love that. And he said, I, I don't know. You know, I, I might not do that. Things aren't really going so well for me. Well, some weeks passed, and it turns out Michael did call her, and these guys got together. What Michael told him is that just... In the last couple of weeks, he had gone out in a field. He had gone out into a field to kill himself. And each time he tried to pull the trigger, several times he tried to pull the trigger, he couldn't do it because he kept thinking of Bruce and Mary Kay and Les and Sue, who always took him out for lunch at Pizza Ranch and the good times they'd had at church and all the laughter that they had shared. So they had a chance to encourage Michael and to pray for him. And it just got me to thinking of all the time and energy I spend on status. <laughs> the things I try to do to make myself look better. And the time that that could be spent interacting with people like Michael. I kept thinking of the opportunity Jesus gives us to just die to all that. And to connect with him and to connect with other people and deep and significant relationships, the kind of stuff that has eternal significance. You know, this kind of living costs something. I did some quick math, and if you add up all of the weeks that Bruce and Mary Kay and Les and Sue have taken guys out after church to lunch at Pizza Ranch, and it's been going on six years now, every single week, and it's about several guys, and if you multiply that times 50, about 50 weeks a year, times really 10 bucks a person at Pizza Ranch. I figured these guys have probably paid about $12,000 $12, in lunches at Pizza Ranch over that time. None of this is doing a lot for their status. But significant relationships are happening. Guys have found Christ. And all their lives really matter. Can you imagine what this world would be like if, like Jesus, we raised up people who were hopeless and helpless and lost, and teaching them that the kingdom of God belongs to them? We'd, we'd be loving, we'd be joyful, we would be magnetic, we'd even be dangerous. We'd be the kind of people that would be intoxicating to be around. Just be comfortable eating with outcasts and sinners, as well as the power brokers of this world, too. I suspect that we would be an irresistible force, lifting up people who've been oppressed, setting those in prison free, giving sight to those who cannot see. I think we'd be about liberating rather than dominating and creating rather than consuming. And others would look at us and see us and say, that, <laughs> that is what Jesus looks like. We would live the kind of life that Paul talks about when he says, to live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up. 
for us. Let's pray together. Jesus, I, I think it's maybe easier to confess um, that we have some bad habits. I think it might be easier to confess that we get angry sometimes and say things we shouldn't. Um, I think it's easier to confess um, saying a cuss word or, or, or even being sometimes in an inappropriate relationship. But it kind of cuts to our court, Lord, if we confess that status is kind of a big deal to us and that we'd like to just look a little better than the next guy <laughs> or the next girl. Um, and all the time and jockeying that we do to set ourselves apart from the crowd. Or how ashamed and how lonely we feel and that we feel like we're never going to measure up. And we sort of brood over that and get stuck in that. And we try to prop ourselves up, but it just never is good enough. So Jesus, we come to you this morning and we say, we're sorry. We even confess that status is a battle for us. And Lord, we pray that you give us the power to die to that, to let go of that, to surrender that. That we remember that we have all the status we need as the sons and daughters of the king when we receive you into our hearts. And that that's sufficient. Lord, we can just be freed up to love one another, to go places we wouldn't go, to talk to people we wouldn't talk to otherwise. And just say we're all just sinners at the foot of the cross. And we look to you for our strength and our hope. So Lord, we come before you just as we are. Lord, and raise us up so we can be about raising others up. We pray in your name. Amen.